that's really okay. Yeah. You good? Okay, great. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If I can just ask everyone to take their seats, we're going to get started. Tough crowd. Thank you so much. That works. Well, thank you everyone for coming in on a, on a rainy day, a little drizzly, um, to this very intimate room for our discussion today. Um, my name is Jayashree Wyatt. I'm the chief of the education outreach section in the outreach division of the Department of Global Communications, where the United Nations Academic Impact Initiative is housed. And this afternoon's event to observe United Nations Day is organized by the United Nations Academic Impact. It's my pleasure to welcome those of you joining us in person and those of you who are also tuning in to watch um, online for our panel discussions this afternoon entitled Higher Education and Multilateralism, Academia Responding to Global Challenges. And as a global community, we all know this, we are facing just an onslaught of challenges and crises. Hunger, inequality are on the rise, myths and disinformation are feeding hatred and division. And women, young people, and the most vulnerable are always hit the hardest. Conflicts are raging and the climate crisis is triggering floods and fires that are ravaging our planet and our homes, forcing millions of people to flee. Higher education plays an absolutely critical role in responding to these challenges through open dialogue, research, teaching, and community engagement, which drives research-based solutions to address these very serious issues. The members of the United Nations Academic Impact Initiative engage actively cultivating and promoting the values of the United Nations, highlighting the importance of multilateralism and solidarity in dealing with global challenges and underlining the values that are enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in the Sustainable Development Goals. Sadly, many of these values are under direct fire and could not be more relevant than they are today. This afternoon, we have two panels. The first with a distinguished group of scholars who are sitting just here to my left. This will be moderated by our Deputy Director and Chief of Partnerships and Global Engagement, Mr. Rob Skinner. And the second panel of students who will be joining the discussion, which will be moderated by my colleague, Mr. Omar Hernandez, who is the program manager of the United Nations Academic Impact. And a big thank you to Omar for bringing us together today and for organizing today's event. But first, it is my pleasure to introduce United Nations Under Secretary General for Global Communications, Ms. Melissa Fleming to deliver our welcoming remarks. Under Secretary General Fleming, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jay Ashri. And so good to see you all here on, on UN Day, this UN Day where we celebrate the United Nations and everything that it stands for. And obviously, um, what it also stands for is, is we the people, and we the people join together who are all trying to make the world uh, a better place using whatever strength that we have. And so I know it, uh, that for us, it's a, you are a precious community um, because of also the influence you have, whether you are uh, teachers, professors, uh, administrators, or also students. So I'm really, really grateful um, to have you here. And we're celebrating achievements, milestones of the United Nations 77 years ago. Um, the world then was reeling from the devastating consequences of World War II. 
Um, here we are. I, I have to rush off right after this to go to a um, crisis meeting around the Ukraine war, which we're having um, on a regular basis. Who would have thought that we'd be experiencing another war in the middle of Europe? Um, and we're seeing the follow-up out everywhere. Um, we're doing what we can. The Secretary General is doing what he can to try, um, he did at the beginning, to try to prevent it. Um, and now he's trying to uh, at least make um, some inroads, uh, for, for in particular the Black Sea Grain Initiative, to mitigate the hunger that's being felt around the world. And, and obviously, the humanitarian action is really important, until which time there will be an opening, hopefully sooner rather than later, for peace. Um, you'll remember that the UN was created um, to save the world for the, from the scourge of war. And yeah, it's, it's imperfect, but try to imagine a world without the UN is what we try to do. Um, and it obviously, what it encapsulates through its UN Charter is global cooperation. And by accepting the Charter, member states committed themselves to the value of multilateralism, to the value of diplomacy for peace. Obviously, those commitments are under immense strain, but we see here day in and day out efforts uh, to really exercise those muscles and you know, to try to make them work. Um, yeah, so the Charter has been violated, um, and we've professed this. Um, and then no old and new conflicts continue to wreak havoc worldwide. Um, we can't forget that we're in also a climate emergency, and that is really close to the point of no return in many countries. Um, we're seeing drought conditions that are um, creating starvation, um, livestock are dying. We're seeing you know, floods unlike anything. You can't point to a time in history, like in Pakistan, for example, where you've seen such horrible floods. Um, and uh, you know, we have, it's so frustrating because we have solutions, and yet uh, there is continuing uh, dragging of feet uh, to take the actions that would be needed to get the um, temperature rise capped at 1.5 degrees and to mitigate um, the worst of what is yet to come. Climate change is happening now. It's frightening, but uh, there's so much more that needs to be done to get, to get governments to reverse course and companies. But we're also seeing you know, that the COVID-19 pandemic has been um, wreaking havoc across the world, as we, we know. But it's been doing so also unequally. Um, uh, you know, those who've had access to the vaccine and medications are, are you know, in, in better shape than those um, who haven't had that access. But incredibly, we're sitting here in the United States, and I think I just read some statistic like only 40 percent of the population has been boosted. So we are awash in vaccines here, and yet because of uh, conspiracy theories, mis- and disinformation that Jayashri was just pointing to, um, that uh, are spread have spread across the world uh, on social media, even if people have access, they feel hesitant to take to take the vaccine. So we're continuing to suffer from the disease itself, but also from the ripple effects, the consequences, um, the socioeconomic consequences from COVID. And as a result of the war in Ukraine, we're seeing food and energy prices spiraling, soaring, inflation spiraling and hunger and poverty rising as a result. Years of development gains being lost. Um, so one thing, though, is really obvious. And here at the GA, um, it's hard when you're hearing all of this noise to feel any hope. But it did. Actually, the Associated Press wrote an article just around this. The, the journalist who was kind of a veteran journalist, and he's come here many years and covered the General Assembly. Um, went around and looked, well, first he looked at the speeches and he interviewed people and he did say, and he didn't only get it from the Secretary General who had a kind of theme woven in his speech, which was hope, but he actually found um, in the speeches of member states and in what people were profess, you know, expressing in the hallways that there was this sense of hope and why? Because people were coming together um, and they were 
coming together around global problems, and that really is what the what the UN is all about. Um, so, yeah, they are they are discussing, not agreeing on everything. There's a lot of polarization. Um, there's a lot of sharp language, um, but we do feel still, and that is that is a sense that the UN does remain the best forum that exists and the best opportunity for the world to find common ground, find ways to create peace and develop a vision for a, a better, inclusive, more equitable, sustainable planet. And this is our slogan where no one is left behind. This is the sustainable development goals. Um, you know, we are seeing, even though everything seems so awful, we're seeing many more people wearing the pin. Every, how many of you all have the a sustainable development goal? It's become like a cult. In fact, there are some conspiracy theories out there that are saying those who wear the pin are part of that global cabal and elite that is going to take over the world and control you. But um, yeah, but it is, it is a, a conspiracy of uh, betterment in all the dimensions um, for our the people who walk on this earth and for the planet that allows us uh, to survive on this earth. So um, we really do believe that members of the UN academic impact can play you know, a really crucial role in helping uh, not just the leaders of our world, but also you know, just all of us who can play a part in searching for solutions. I think that we've seen very often you know, people who are kind of just working for their own and their own families, in not just survival, but gain or betterment, um, are also not feeling very gratified. People are looking for community. They're looking for ways to help. I think more and more young people are looking uh, for careers that are serving the common good. Or if they're going to work for companies, they want to know, uh, is that company signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals not investing in fossil fuels um, and, and not exploiting people and doing the right thing. So I think we are seeing some change and some hope that we can embrace. So yeah, obviously um, your role connecting to young people, inspiring young people, we have lots of young people here is really crucial. And um, we hope that our UN uh, academic impact can serve as a kind of convening role, catalyzing role to bring together professors, researchers, young students for events like these. So I'm really pleased to open today's discussion. It's called Higher Education and Multilateralism, Academia Responding to Global Challenges. Always been a valuable partner with the UN, and this connection has only grown since adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. So we have the opportunity to hear from our member institutions about they're thinking on the UN, and we absolutely are open to criticism, um, but also the role we play on the global stage. Uh, and we also will hear about the relationship between academia and the United Nations, challenges, but also solutions. You can be really part of the solutions. We're really emphasizing um, solutions, not just that come from us, but that bubble up um, from, from around. Um, so, Soon we're going to celebrate the 20th, 12th anniversary of UNAI. We have 1,600 member institutions in more than 115 countries, and we hope that all of you will celebrate this with us. But we look forward also to enhancing our collaboration in the coming years um, so that we can share knowledge across this incredible network and also your solutions um, that we can all work together to create a better world. So have a wonderful event today. Um, I'll be following on and off and in and out, and I'll get, um, I'm looking forward to hearing how it went. Very sorry again that I have to leave you, but over to Rob to take it from here. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, Under Secretary General Fleming. And, and those of us that know your schedule know how um, much we all appreciate oh. you being here with us today. The because highlight I've of my day. <laughs> highlight of my day. <laughs> no, uh, truly, as as always, uh, USG Fleming, as we see, USG Under Secretary General Fleming, uh, framed up this conversation so well. 
um, as she always does. And, and I do mean that we were feeling very good to be able to have her join us uh, this afternoon because every, every day I get her schedule in front of me um, in the morning and see what it's like. And it is basically eight to eight packed. And I know that she's taking calls from the Secretary General in the hours after that. Um, so um, it, it's great to have her here and, and to have the opportunity to hear from her um, because she really does take a, a real interest in our partnerships, our engagements, particularly with the academic community. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy that she was here, um, ladies and gentlemen, to be with us here on UN Day. And happy UN Day. You know, there's a lot going on in the world, but we should celebrate, right? 77 years, the, the institution is still standing um, and still playing its critical role in, in the world. Um, Josh, you introduced me, but I'll do it again now. My name is Robert Skinner, and I'm the Deputy Director and Chief of Partnerships and Global Engagement at the United Nations Department of Global Communication. That's a lot to put on a business card, um, <laughs> which is why I don't carry one. <laughs> um, but I'm easy to find, um, and I hope that all of you will take the opportunity to follow up if you'd like to. I mean, it's really great to see all of you here um, and joining in this UN Academic Impact event. We did hold, about three weeks ago, an in-person event, but we held it at Utah Valley University um, and brought together a lot of our, our membership kind of out in the western part of the United States and from folks from around the world were able to join us. But this is the first UNAI event that we have done here at UN headquarters in about three years. So thanks to all of you for joining us and joining in this kind of intimate setting. If you came in, you could see that the UN is doing business right now. As you walk by all of the conference rooms that are in the corridors, uh, there are General Assembly committee meetings taking place in all of them. And again, uh, we're fortunate and feel good uh, that the committee, uh, the conference folks, recognize the importance of academic impact on our engagement with the academic community to allow us all to have uh, a room here during this busy time at, at the United Nations. You know, today's event, titled Higher Education and Multilateralism, Academia Responding to Global Challenges, as U.S. Chief Fleming said, is really an opportunity to reflect on the engagement of universities around the world with the U.N. Um, and while our participants today tend to come from institutions that are within relatively easy travel distance <laughs> from the United Nations, you know, we trust that the conversation will, will resonate and, and cover the issues that all of our membership in UNAI has, the, the over 1,600 members that are part of, of this amazing network um, that engage on these critical issues. And you know, our partnerships team advocates for meaningful collaborations with stakeholders from all sectors, but particularly in this case, academia. And I've spent much of my career doing this type of engagement and working with the different sectors and trying to bring those sectors together. You know, today we're talking about academia, but we know that in many cases we need to break the silos so that academia is talking to us at the UN, talking to the governments, talking to the private sector, talking to civil society, because we're all pulling in the same direction and we need to be talking to each other. So, you know, so bringing this conversation with academia is important, but we have to always expand that and think about how we make the connections across all those sectors. Um, particularly, it, it, you know, we can't repeat enough how challenging these times are, um, you know, with all the issues in front of us that USG Fleming and, and Josh referenced in their, in their remarks. Um, it's even more essential that we work with, you know, the academics, the students, and the university communities, um, you know, all of your institutions are so important in your communities and have great influence in making sure we're, we're talking to them and, and seeking solutions together and really driving positive change, seeking those solutions that have been putting them into action and making the change we all need. So I'm honored to moderate the first panel, which is entitled Teaching, Research, and Writing about Multilateralism and the United Nations, Reflections, Lessons Learned, and Knowledge Sharing. And for that, we have five distinguished speakers from prestigious institutions, uh, like I said, generally from the, the local New York area in this particular case. But we're really honored to have you know, these amazing scholars with us today. And the way I'm going to do this, I'm not going to introduce them all at the outset because you know, we, we have five of them. And it might, you know, by the time the fifth speaker goes, you're like, yeah, I'm not quite sure remembering you know, <laughs> maybe who it is. So we'll introduce them all uh, just before they speak. And we're going to kind of go to, from my left to my further left, I, I guess, down the row here. Um, and, and give them all an opportunity to provide opening remarks of about five minutes, um, and then we'll take some questions. I'll probably ask a couple questions, and I ask the panelists if, if we have time, we may even uh, open it up a little bit to hear some questions from all of you. So, so be thinking about what you might want to hear uh, about you know, the relationship between academia and the United Nations as, as the focus of today's conversation. Um, so to get us started, uh, Dr. Daniel Nauyuks, 
the lecturer of international and public affairs and director of international organization and UN studies specialization at Columbia University is, is going to get us started. And he is also, uh, Daniel is also an advisor to several UN agencies, so knows us well. Um, over to you. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, everybody, for being here. It is my distinct pleasure to, um, to address you and a very big privilege. Um, as Rob said, I direct um, the International Innovation and UN Studies program at Columbia University School of International Public Affairs. In the next few minutes, I'm sharing at the meta level um, three things that higher ed, academia, and universities contribute and can and should contribute to the UN. And um, I'm trying to coin a hashtag, WTF. Um, these are the three things I'm going to um, raise. Um, W for writing and research. Research might, may or may not start with a W, I haven't checked. Um, um, think tank role, T, and um, F for forging of talent. I'm starting to reverse order. Um, so the first thing that we do as academia and uh, higher ed is forging talent for the United Nations. And um, we're trying to do education for, with, and about the UN. And one thing that is really a privilege for somebody like me who's teaching at an institution where all the students really have this amazing enthusiasm for multilateral cooperation. Right? And that's when I bring speakers from outside. They're always like, and reinvigorated about the, the, the belief that students have in our institution in the role of multilateral cooperation in spite of all the challenges. So we do skills training on human rights, on peace, on technology, on data, on sustainable development, climate, humanitarian responses, um, on all the different things between them to enable students and harness what students already know to make them um, um, good workers and, and can contribute to the reforming the things that the UN is doing. SIPA, my own um, school, School of International Public Affairs, was founded in order to fill a gap um, to produce... Um, and train experts for the UN, right? So um, right, as of now, we have more than 800 alumni who work across the UN system, which is a great privilege. Um, one thing we do and we try to do, and I think I encourage more institutions, institutions, institutions to do that, is to role play simulations. And not just model UN, but also um, UN country team simulations, climate negotiations, um, UNGA negotiations, um, writing UN briefing notes, and other things that are really important for the UN. But in addition to just teaching students, which is a very, like, you think teach students as a passive role, we also try to leverage students' expertise and ideas for um, contributing to the UN to things. For example, um, two years ago for the UN 75 anniversary, we had a hackathon, 120 students. Um, for a week, they, they, they discussed different things and we um, submitted the student report as, a, as an official contribution to the UN 75. Next week, um, um, at this time, I'll be in Istanbul um, with um, Columbia Global Center Istanbul, where we have a workshop to where we student-led research on global citizenship education, where students from um, around the world, but mostly from Istanbul, um, will actually work on what it means to do um, at university level uh, global citizenship education. And we have capstone projects, which Ali and, um, work with UN agencies to actually work on a, a consultancy basis to actually in, in, introduce student expertise into these areas. The second area, we work on a think tank role. And the first thing there is that we, that we see ourselves amplifying the ideas and, and messages from the UN, right? Through outreach events, through social media, and other forms we really try to amplify what the UN is doing. But of course, we are not just blindly amplifying whatever the UN is doing. We also have a watchdog role. So um, we really try to see how decolonizing aid, how racism within the UN, how effectiveness issues with the UN have to be resolved, right? Being the sounding board for the UN and, and offer advice. If you're not uh, aware of that, we have a blog that we launched exactly um, a year ago on UN Day last year. It's called Multilateralism in Action. You find it online, um, we can subscribe to it. But we try to do both. We have UN experts, academics, and students who write for this. Action analysis is what we need to push multilateralism forward. We also do training and, 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 and expert discussions um, for things like the, um, the Kent program that led by my colleague Jean-Marie um, Guénaud, who used to be Under Secretary General for, for Peacekeeping Operations when it was still called Peacekeeping Operations, um, has, um, leads the Kent program on international um, and conflict resolution, where people from the UN and people from the permanent missions come and learn from academics, from seasoned experts about this. The last role um, is about research. 
UN staff members um, often are very short um, in time. Like the short term things, they're very quickly turn around. They don't have the, um, in most cases, the, the luxury of getting deeper, really getting into longer term data analysis. And that's where academia comes in. Bring in the hard science, bring in data analysts, we bring in ideas that get long, more long term. Um, and sometimes beyond international relations. Um, for example, the reform of the role of multilateralism regional level cooperation. One thing that I have a large research project, for example, on national level um, um, entities, what uh, UN development system frameworks or cooperation frameworks as have been re renamed a couple of years ago, how the UN works in the country level, how they influence, how they're independent, interdependent, dependent, what impacts they have on on policy process and processes on the, on the local level. We often think about the UN as a global thing, but forgetting that in 133 countries, the UN is on the ground with country teams, exposed to donor um, roles, etc. So like studying the entire global, regional, and, and local level is what we need to do. I'm stopping here. I'm looking forward to more um, 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 comments from my distinguished colleagues and to your, um, to your enthusiasm. I'm, I'm happy students are here. I, I really value always your, in, in, in your ideas and contributions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Nyax. And, and uh, you said a lot of really interesting things in the, in the WTF framework there. But I really like what you talked about. You know, leveraging the students and taking their engagement and and using that um, so that they're involved. But also, we all have so much to learn from them. You know, and and I and I recognize that every time I have a chance to engage with students that are that are part of the UNAI network. All right. Um, our next speaker is, is Ms. Savita Ponde. She is the executive director of the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect at the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies at the City University of New York. Ms. Ponde, over to you. Thank you so much. It's on, okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and happy UN Day. And also for all of those who are celebrating today, happy Diwali. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm a bit of an anomaly on this panel since I'm really not an academic. Um, I'm an advocate who works very closely with UN member states and the UN Secretariat um, on issues related to atrocity prevention and the responsibility to protect. Um, but it's really a privilege to be here to just talk about the role of uh, academia. I think that Danielle very clearly laid out um, what the role is, and I'm just going to sort of build on it. I don't have any... Um, you know, uh, very dramatic ideas here, but it's just sort of building on what he said. So um, I think academia really leads the way in terms of um, thoughts, in terms of, you know, how we think about the international system, um, how we examine it, how we re-examine it, how we sort of question conventional wisdom and, and conventional sort of truths or truths that we, you know, think are the, 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 the way the world is. And academia sort of constantly breaks um, many of these, uh, uh, understanding many of these truths and brings about a new picture and sometimes sort of makes us, uh, as policymakers who work within the UN, outside of the UN, on the multilateral level, uh, on what it actually means to have an impact on the ground. I think that it's the work of the, uh, you know, a, a lot of academic literature on genocide uh, studies, which then informed, uh, you know, the adoption of the Genocide Convention. It was a lot of work of genocide scholars, which then led to um, an understanding of what it means to uh, prevent atrocity crimes. Uh, how do we do it uh, at a national level, at a regional level, at a multilateral level? Um, it's the academia which has thought about how um, systematic discrimination of women in any society can lead to large-scale conflict or wars uh, uh, even. Or to sort of, as Daniel said, the whole discussion on decolonization comes from, you know, English literature and comparative fields, not even from international politics, actually. So a lot of these discussions, a lot of these truths are constantly re-examined ex examined by um, uh, academia. And the rigor that academia brings to policy uh, to policy making is so important in terms of like how we um, actually have, uh, you know, change lives on the ground. So that's sort of the, the, uh, the first point. The second is that 
I'm sure Robert, you and your team do a great job in terms of global outreach, but nobody does a better job of uh, talking about the value add of UN than the academics themselves. I think that you inculcate in people um, the, the value of the UN, the, the value that, um, you know, like what it could be, uh, what the world would be without the UN, as, as um, USG Fleming just said. So there is no other outreach program out there which has a, as much impact as atom, academics coming together and talking about the UN. And again, not only just in terms of, you know, um, uh, amplifying the good things the UN does, but also amplifying and questioning many of the things that the UN has not done very well, or in the multilateral system, how we talk about development and sort of, you know, how we engage with communities on the ground and things like that. Um, the final thing I would like to say is that, um, and coming back to the field that I work on, which is atrocity prevention and R2P, and no, two more thoughts. One thought is that the, the think tank function, Daniel, that you talked about, and the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect um, is based at the City University of New York. We are based at the Ralph Punch Institute, and we are based there for a reason, because the Ralph Punch Institute, at the time when you know the Canadian government brought together some you know world leaders and thinkers to think about how do we sort of get around the issue of national sovereignty when populations are at threat of genocide, ethnic cleansing, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Ralph Bunch actually acted as a secretariat. Actually, Peter worked on that report with Professor Tom Bees. And, and then, you know, when the idea of sort of the global center, like, you know, that we should have sort of a center which talks about atrocity prevention, which works at the UN to take this idea forward, the, you know, CUNY was a very sort of, you know, organic home for it. And, and that's the reason we are there. And it's a huge amount of um, support from CUNY, its economies of scales that allow small organizations like the Global Center uh, to function for us to be able to do our job with the UN in, a, in, a, in an expensive city. Um, and my sort of final thought is that, um, you know, academia also, uh, you know, we have sustainable development goals. Now there's a lot of discussion within the UN about the new agenda for peace. So all of these things, you know, all these new discussions keep on happening about how do we improve multilateralism. And I have worked with some really brilliant academics who are not only coming up with new ideas, but are also thinking that what do we do when the system, when the UN Security Council, and you know, many of you around the room study it, uh, see that how deadlocked it is. You know, there's not a lot of action on situations like Ethiopia, Myanmar, Yemen. I mean, the list is long. If you go on the Global Center website, you will see right now, right now we are monitoring over 26 countries where there is a risk of atrocities or atrocities are ongoing. And in that context, uh, a group of academics came together, and you know we were very privileged to to sort of co-host and and also to co-launch this report. It was about the role of the General Assembly. What can the UN do with what it actually already has? Rather than thinking about new things, what can the General Assembly do to respond to crises when um, the UN Security Council doesn't work? And that report cannot be written by policymakers because we're just so busy. We, we jump from one thing to the other. There are 10 meetings a day, and you're running from one crisis to the other. But academics who can take the time, look at what you know, previously uh, the General Assembly has done around South Africa and apartheid in responding to crimes against humanity around the world and how it can use uniting for peace and many different mechanisms that it already has to make a difference. So I'll stop there and just say that thank you so much for having me on this panel and uh, I look forward to hearing from everyone. Thank you, Savita. And to, your, and to your last point, I think you see the, for example, the General Assembly stepping up and in, in taking a more proactive and, and active role um, in situations. Just the, the war in Ukraine, just as the example, it's probably the, the strongest at the moment. But I think it's happening in other spaces as well. Um, and I also take your point that, um, you know, the, the academic community and university stepping up and, and helping us as validators of the importance of the United Nations. We can talk as much as we want about how great we think we are, uh, but that's expected of us. We are the institution after all. But when we have, you know, scholars and others that, that look at the, our work, it's great to have that support. But it's also great to have the questions as well. And I think, you know, uh, USG Fleming said that as well. We need to have, you know, people looking at us and, and we need to understand the criticism to make our work more effective, to, to do better, basically. Thank you.
Um, next on, on our agenda is, is Dr. Peter Hoffman. He's an associate professor and director of the graduate programs in international affairs and director of the UN summer study program at the new school um, right here in, in New York. And he's also the author of the book, Humanitarianism, War and Politics, Solferino to Syria and Beyond. Dr. Hoffman, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, well, first, uh, two bits of thanks. One first to our hosts for organizing this event. It's very timely and always great to see many of my colleagues again. The other bit of thanks I want to start with is actually to uh, my two predecessors on this panel, uh, Daniel and Savita, who've done a lot of the heavy lifting already for us, I think, by putting a lot of great stuff on the table. I don't want to repeat those things, so I, let me uh, take the conversation in perhaps a slightly different direction, building on some of their ideas as well. I think every educator who works on the UN system, we're all interested in documenting the nature and scope of challenges that the organization faces, whether it's conflict, humanitarianism, human rights, conflict, uh, climate change. We also are very interested in training the next generation to give them the necessary skills and experiences they need. But here's where I wanna slightly pivot and say that I think we have to start with some hard truths. And it's about defining the problem. Uh, that the intersection, I think, for youth engagement with the UN system. It's a, it's a political problem, not a technical problem. I think the, the youth are capable, uh, the skills they can learn in graduate programs and undergraduate programs are certainly available for them. But we first have to admit what's really going on here. And I wanna acknowledge a couple of lamentations I hear from many students today. These are hard, bitter pills, but one question I routinely get is, what's the point in preparing for a future that doesn't exist? The second question that I hear a lot around in the UN, and it hurts me to hear it, but I, it, we have to say it, is what does the generation that created all of these problems have to offer us in terms of solutions when they pursued none themselves? Those are really difficult things for us to hear because we really want to change the world for the better. So having said those things, let me also put it back at some of the students and say some things to you that I think may also help you figure out what your piece in all of this is. If we wanna change the structure of the UN, we need to change the context. If we wanna change the context, we need to change the participants and their perspectives. And this is where the whole agenda, I think, is building increasingly around decolonizing international affairs. And it may be even something about decolonizing the United Nations itself. Decolonization, as we often heard in textbooks, is about you know, the independence of states that used to be the third world, now the global south, get independent but it's much broader than that. It's about knowledge production. It's not just about access to knowledge, it's about access to the means of knowledge production. So what do we have to do? We need to reach out in terms of cultivating critical imagination. Critical, what do I mean by critical? Critical is a term everybody throws around all the time. Everybody says, oh, it's about asking hard-hitting questions. It's not just about asking hard-hitting questions. It's about a commitment to human rights. You have to couple those things together. We need to inspire imagination. We need to get the youth invested in taking part in what the United Nations is about. In American education in the last few years, there's been a lot of controversy around something known as the 1619 Project, which is about telling the story of the US from the arrival of slaves. What academia and what the youth need to be involved in is something that we might call the 1945 Project. We need to talk about what the UN, how it was built, what impacts it has had. We need to change the narrative around the UN. We need more voices at the table. Decolonizing the UN and international affairs more broadly is about creating knowledge platforms that we can get the youth engaged in to have their agency expressed. To students, it, this is not just about us providing it. It also means that you yourselves have to step up. There's an old African aphorism. You're either at the table or you're on the menu. So you have mm -hmm. to step up too. For the UN and for my colleagues, I wanna remind everybody of an aphorism that was associated, it used to be with the so-called disability movement in the 70s, but has now become much more about democracy. And that is nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. Intergenerational equity. This I think is really the most important topic for many youth today. If you look in our common agenda, uh, the most recent uh, statement put forward by the Secretary General, this is a window 
into how you can get involved in the UN system. Uh, one of the proposals within it, not just a new agenda for peace, as Savita was mentioning, but it also has a lot of stuff about intergenerational equity that I encourage students to look into. Let me just um, say a few final things here about some uh, ways to improve the relationship between academia and the UN. I think, obviously, being candid and transparency is uh, central to all of this. But for faculty and scholars, we need to get more involved in what in the academy we often refer to as norm entrepreneurship. We have to take some of these ideas. We have to carry the weight for many of our UN colleagues. Many of the fiercest critics I know sometimes of the UN are people who've been inside the UN system. And they, see, they feel sometimes constrained in what they can say in their role diplomatically. That makes perfect sense. We have to be moving the goalposts, helping them in that way. Because we can do that from our comfortable, privileged positions. Um, for students, um, we need you to be more adaptive and responsive to the moment. We want to provide you with the practical skills, but you yourself will be involved in changing what this organization will look like. I think it was Emerson who said, every generation must write its own books. Every generation must have its own international organization. So we will be there to support you. I think the UN is keen to hear from you, but we also need you to walk through that door. And I'm going to just leave it there. Thank you. Now, um, thank you, Peter. And I'll just, just echo what you said at the end. I mean, we want to hear from you. Um, we know that uh, there are some structural issues that make it hard in some cases for youth to really feel like they're engaged with the UN and able to drive change. I would say that the Secretary General, Secretary General Guterres, is really committed to that. I mean, that's why in the Our Common Agenda report, he's, he has uh, he recommended um, changing the Youth Envoy's office, to, uh, um, ramping it up and making an actual office within his, uh, ex the Executive Office of the Secretary General, which the General Assembly has approved. Um, so we think that will improve the relations and provide greater opportunity for youth engagement. But most of all, we just have to get ourselves that work for the UN engaged with young people. And we have to convince our member states how important it is that they engage with, with young people. Because what I tell my colleagues is, you know, when I hear from young people, when I hear impatience, and justified impatience with what my generation has done and, and how uh, with the planet and the political circumstances we left behind. And if we don't hear, you let your voices in, we're all just going to get run over because you are have had enough, I think. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there because I am a UN official. And <laughs> as Peter said, sometimes we can't say everything we want to say. <laughs> uh, but ne next on, on, on our speaker list is, is Dr. S. Ilu Osler. Professor of Political Science and International Relations at the State University of New York, New Paltz, SUNY New Paltz, and founder and director of its Global Engagement Program. She's also the founder of the Mid-Hudson Valley Local Chapter of the United Nations Association of the USA, UNA USA. Uh, Dr. Osler, over to you. All right, yes. excellent. Well, I thank the United Nations Academic Impact for this invitation. Um, coming from a small public university uh, in the rural Hudson Valley, it's an honor to be included in this panel um, uh, and celebrating the United Nations Day with all of you. Um, at SUNY New Paltz, we are very committed to active learning from local to global, and um, I want to today share with you how we try to inspire our students to um, achieve UN's goals of global peace, sustainability, and, and also um, a ju just world, a dignified just world and human rights. Um, as a campus, we do this on three levels. Uh, one is through programming that I run, uh, where we bring the students to the United Nations, um, directly engaging with the UN. The second one is by bringing UN's ideals to our campus. Um, through our curriculum and everyday practices. And a third way is to engage with our rural Hudson Valley community directly um, through the um, different programmings that we do. Um, first, our uh, direct engagement. Um, since 1978, uh, SUNY New Paltz has been teaching a UN semester course where we bring students to the United Nations. So our political science and international relations department has brought over a, a thousand students through the gates of the United Nations um, to hear from UN officials, working with the UN Global Communications Speakers Bureau. Um, most of our students tell me that this is the most impactful 
and meaningful class that they have taken. And this includes those from 1978 who are working in Goldman Sachs today, right? So, I mean, the, there are people that I talk to, they say this was life-changing for them. Our students carry the vision from this organization into their work wherever they go. Um, just as an obvious example, I had a student who graduated a few years back, went and got a job in a, um, in a development investment firm that was advising Japanese investors who were investing in uh, Africa. And um, she brought up the sustainable development goals of the UN as an assessment tool um, to her boss. And her boss was like, I never heard that. Let's check into it. And then they incorporated UN SDGs. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm wearing the pin. But I am critical of the UN SDGs from an academic perspective. But I will take that, right? So it's kind of like it's, it's academia at work in education changing the minds and hearts um, and while this was an obvious example of how we actually see the change, um, everyday global perspectives on the promise of cooperation and collaboration resonate from the UN semester course that I teach. Um, of course, again, we're not blind to the challenges that this organization faces, thus global peace, sustainability, and human rights face. Um, but, and I have a frank assessment in class about what those challenges are. Yet, it is inspirational for my students to hear from UN officials who are responding to those challenges head on every day. So bringing the students into the UN um, is very inspirational. So to enable our students to become practitioners, because we have many uh, working class students, immigrant students, students from rural areas, uh, 10 years ago, I founded the SUNY Global Engagement Program in New York City, where we bring a group of SUNY students into, and it's open to all students, actually. We, we bring these students to come into New York City and practice at the UN through internships. So my students went on from learning about the UN, practicing at the UN, their internships, and then getting inspired to get jobs at the internships. And I have, actually, UN's educational programs and staff who have been key in creating these opportunities to thank for. Because we're a very small institution, we depend on your support on those kinds of progress as well. So it goes both ways. Um, in addition to engaging with UN directly, uh, the second way we connect uh, with the UN is through teaching and uh, practices are on campus. Many colleagues are working to incorporate the UN Sustainable Development Goals into their um, curriculum. Uh, our, for example, our theater arts department professor, Andrea Varga, teaches about the SDGs in her theater arts classes. And then she went on to in introduce sustainable costume and uh, design ideas into our um, theater productions. Um, our business school is mapping their curriculum using the UN SDGs. And a group of faculty and staff on campus are now pushing to incorporate the UN Sustainable Development Goals to guide us in our core mission of the university. Um, just last year alone, Sustainability Committee of our campus has reviewed 30 courses incorporating the UN SDGs as a, um, as a guide. Um, so it's, um, it's a really uh, work in progress on our little campus, but we are really incorporating UN's work into our work. Um, a third way in which we engage is through our community engagement. And SUNY New Paltz Center for International Programs was key in um, spearheading the founding of the United Nations Association. As a matter of fact, it was founded in these round tables um, that were happening in my UN semester class that included community members too that were consulting towards the sustainable development goals um, that was going into a report that UN Foundation and UNA were writing together to hand to the UN um, itself. So it's kind of like this intersection between community um, and, um, and the university. Uh, this small yet active local chapter carries um, educational programs reaching s rural high school students and community members that would ordinarily not hear about the United Nations. And both student and local chapter actively engage with our Congress people um, to support the United Nations work. So we do a lot of advocacy as well. 
So our campus, especially um, uh, my department, has been actively engaged, building strong ties with the United Nations for many years. And uh, we really appreciated the founding of the UN Academic Impact in 2010 because that kind of gave a home and a recognition to the work that we were doing and, and kind of guided us in putting it all together. And I want to thank you and all of the UN staff for, from whom all, all over the years supported our mission bringing theory and practice together. I'm going to name a few. Ramu Damodoran, uh, blast from the past in, in first started um, working with, Swat Fenuh Chaloub, Swati Dave, Jennifer Longo, G.A. Shin, Lily Schindler, Anna manero -Vayes, um, uh, hundreds of speakers at, at the UN and, and tens and maybe twenties of UN supervisors who have taken my students. Um, you have all inspired thousands of SUNY students um, to become proponents of multilateralism over the years. So thank you very much. No, no. Um, thank, thank you, Ilgu, because I know um, how much work you do to connect the UN to the, the not just uh, SUNY New Paltz, but to the entire community up there. I mean, and we've had interaction before, and I know that uh, Ramu, who is my predecessor, would uh, certainly welcome hearing that from you as well, and all the others that you listed, and we'll certainly pass that along to all of them that we'll see in the in the course of the week. And the one thing that that I was really encouraged to hear is this idea that it's not just you know sort of in the international affairs area on campus that this UN conversation and SDG conversation is taking place because it really needs to be driven across the entire uh, entire campus and into the communities because you know we need investment bankers and business people and uh, doctors and lawyers and everyone to be thinking about these issues and having them aware of and understanding it that the SDGs in, in this particular case that you referenced, it connects to everything. It connects to everything that happens in society and, and having that conversation and making them aware of the linkages um, you know, helps them hopefully take that into whatever they're doing, not just those of us that end up in diplomacy or national affairs um, or development jobs. So, so thank you for that. Um, certainly last but not least on, on, our, on our speaker's list is um, Dr. Courtney Smith, who is the Dean of the School of Diplomacy and International Relations, an affiliate with the Center for UN and Global Governance Studies at Seton Hall University in New Jersey. He's the Assistant Treasurer of the Academic Council on the United Nations System and the author of the book Politics and Process at the United Nations, The Global Dance. I can also say that he hosted Secretary General Guterres for the Seton Hall Commencement Address um, last May, last May, um, uh, which was really a great opportunity for our Secretary General to get out and speak at a, at a university close by and, and, and participate with the students there. So we thank you for pursuing that, uh, uh, Dr. Smith. Over to you. Thanking you and your colleagues in uh, in your department for helping uh, ha have us host the Secretary General. It was a wonderful experience, and we we're very grateful for the work that you and the Under Secretary General did to make it happen. Um, thank you to the fellow panelists. I'm really excited and inspired by your comments. And I really want to thank uh, the members of the audience, not only in the room and outside, a lot of youth in the room. And my comments are going to be bookended by uh, thinking about youth, as was the case with the other panelists. Um, the panelists were given um, kind of three uh, different guiding questions that could, and I want to just make a few comments about each. They will echo some things that have already been said and hopefully provoke some conversation. The first question we were asked to consider is what universities worldwide are doing concerning global challenges? And I think here universities have a couple of key roles. Uh, one that's already been highlighted in the first is to create an environment so students can be inspired to think about how they can play a role in addressing global change. Um, our university is uh, focused on servant leadership, about going out and making a difference in our local, our national, or international communities. And the role of a university is to create a space to incubate that, to inspire that, to, so students can think about their own role in building social justice. The second piece of that is our role is in professional education, how we create an environment that connects theory to practice so our students can make that production. So what does that mean? First, we have to help them build the knowledge that they're gonna need to make a difference, right? And so that involves designing our curriculum in ways that allow students to think about the connections that the other panelists have highlighted. So you can integrate across disciplines to figure out exactly what pieces of knowledge are gonna be key for you. 
then we need to go beyond that and think about how we're delivering that to you all, making sure we have the right faculty, and not just faculty that are uh, excellent academic researchers, but also faculty members who are professors of practice, who've worked in international affairs, a lot of those who've worked actually here at the UN. Finally, then, we need to figure out how to build your skills, to connect that knowledge to your skills. In our case, we do that through a required professional internship program. Some colleagues have talked about the benefit of those programs, but also through a lot of different active learning strategies that they've highlighted, um, simulations, a model, award-winning model UN program, um, workshops on op-ed and policy memo writing, and in our case, uh, courses in a joint degree created in consultation with the United Nations Institute of Training and Research. So we really have to help you be inspired, generate your knowledge, and then apply them through skills. The second um, question we were asked is, what multilateralism means for institutions of higher education? And I have, um, I think it means two things that challenge institutions of higher education, and two creates two opportunities for us. The two ways multilateralism challenges us is multilateralism is a complex environment, right? So we need to make sure we are creating students that can operate in that environment, diversifying the field, um, thinking about cross-cultural awareness, global competencies, um, thinking about how in a very divisive political environment we can inspire people to think about collective solutions and not just what's in it for us. The second thing is it mandates that we try and uh, stay abreast of the full scope of the SDG agenda. I mean, 17 goals, 269 targets. I mean, that's a lot of stuff that you've got to cover in your, in your curriculum. So, um, so those are the challenges it prevents to us. But it also creates an opportunity. Um, and this is an opportunity, I think, in particular to us being close by. A number of us have highlighted programs that we actually have meeting at the UN. In our case, it's the United Nations Intensive Summer Study Program. But it's not just here. It's taking students to the European Union, taking them to the African Union, taking them down to Washington, D.C. so they can see the OAS or the Bretton Woods institutions. It's make, and it's places like at Utah Valley. It's great. I loved seeing the information about the, about the conference that was just held there. So it's, I mean, we're maybe privileged because we're near New York, but it's not just for us. It's we've got to get the students out and, and have them experience multilateralism. The last and final question is, what do these institutions mean to the United Nations? And I think we um, hopefully help and support the UN in, in a couple of different ways, some of which have, again, already been highlighted for, uh, before, but I'll just um, reiterate them in kind of an order. Um, the first is that we play a role in spreading the good work about the UN. Uh, we do this through um, by sending our students to UN meetings, having them do podcasts or reports, our publications, our website, our social media, and also by giving a platform to UN officials. Um, Rob mentioned the Secretary General speaking at our commencement. We regularly try and host the U.S. Ambassador to the UN um, and had our fourth um, Linda Thomas Green came in April, which was our fourth U.S. ambassador to the UN on campus, making sure those events are very much student uh, centered and student driven. Second thing is we hopefully are helping the UN actually really do its work. We're providing student intern in their offices, alumni working in their offices, colleagues have highlighted that, faculty serving as experts for various UN missions and offices, and also through our scholarly research, as has been highlighted, through publications like in Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, you know, the journals that are, that are followed in the field. Um, Another way um, that we support the work of the UN is by formally collaborating through the inst institutional structures that the UN has. And by that, I mean not only having NGO status with the Department of Global Communications, but also as some universities are doing, as we're doing right now, is moving to having ECOSOC status, okay, where, where, it's a, a, where we're actually contributing to the work of the UN. And the last thing, and I think the most obvious thing that, that universities do to help the UN is that we motivate and train youth. And again, I said we'd bookend around youth. That's what it's all about. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I don't think I'm alone when I say the goals that are elaborated in the SDGs will be, not be the last time our international community will come up with need to come up with global goals. The agenda says 2030. It's going to go on far beyond that, far beyond any of us sitting at this table, and it's going to go be on your shoulders. So we need to motivate and train and help you to take the next steps that we're not going to finish. So, thank you. Uh, 
Yes, Courtney, we'd all love to believe that in 2030, the SDGs will all be achieved and we can all move on, but <laughs> I suspect you're right, that that's not gonna happen. Um, but I also I take your, you know, your, your point on the complexity of you know, the international affairs and in, including the structure of the UN itself and then the many bodies that make up it, the agencies, funds, and programs. And the one thing that I would always uh, you know, let students and young people know, always ask the question that you think you know, everybody else knows the answer to and you're the only one who doesn't. I learn a new acronym, um, a new phrase, a new something at the UN every day. And I've been around here more years than I'd like to really admit to. Um, so in, in almost every case, everyone's asking the same question you are, but no one will, is, a, is, is willing to do it. So please voice those questions when you hear them, whether you're hearing from a UN speaker um, uh, someone from one of the member states, uh, go ahead and ask, please. And, and given that, I'm going to kind of uh, go off script here. Um, I had a kind of a list of questions that I was going to ask the panelists. Um, but, you know, after hearing from all of them and their engagement with young people, I think we should, you know, let all of you ask questions um, and, and have an opportunity to, uh, you know, hear from the panelists on what you're thinking about. And then if the, at the end, if we have a minute, I'll, I'll ask one final question. But so I think what we'd like to do, if, if folks have questions, which I trust that you do, take three questions uh, for the panel, and I think we can do it that way. And then uh, they can all uh, respond to whichever one they feel um, most makes sense. So I, I see a hand straight in front of me. <laughs> yes. Um, happy UN Day and happy Diwali to those who are celebrated. Thank you so much. It's an honor for me to be here. My name is Teres Nagara, Master of Public Administration at SIPA, Columbia University, coming from far away Indonesia, um, specifically a small town called Tiamis. Um, I've been very active in advancing um, and promoting youth empowerment community engagements and development and, and education equality and advocacy for more than nine years in my hometown in Chiamis. And kindly please allow me to share some kind of brief information experiences of mine before addressing the question to the panelists that are very wonderful and amazing. So 8.9. Uh, I, I, I would ask in the interest of time, please be oh, brief sure. so, we okay. can get a, so we can get a couple of other questions okay, sure. as well. Uh, okay. So thank you. Thank you. So um, 8.9 million Indonesian higher education students studying in Indonesia. Um, but sadly speaking, some of the educational infrastructures are left still behind and considered as not appropriate place to study. Some people have to you know, cross the rivers, everything, and struggling with the electricity and developments. And indeed, there is a lot of foreign assistance coming from various stakeholders, but some people could not access to higher education, which leave no one behind. It's always our visions and spirit. In this regard, what do you think of the reality that we're facing now? How the would the UN, especially UN academia, respond to this kind of challenges as education equality, education lack of access and infrastructures in the rural and underdeveloped areas? And what is the relationship between in UN academia in this development issue and multilateralisms? And what is the role of us as the future leaders, as the youth and policy makers from academic backgrounds? And what is a youth engagement program in collaboration with UN? Because some how not all the youth from all over the world could not have this kind of opportunity to raise our voices in international stage to involve together in the U with the UN in order to promote sustainable peace and work together. Because we do believe that youth is the future, empower the youth and inspire them is very true, and hand in hand together with diverse thought initiative to bring inclusive change. Raise the voiceless, voice the voiceless for some unheard and unseen. Thank you. No, thank you. Interesting thoughts and a, and a great question. Um, other hands? I, um, okay, just here. I'm, I'm, this is not scientific. I'm just kind <laughs> of. Um, I'm Emma Hartman from Lehigh University. And my question is uh, for Dr. Hoffman, but for anyone. You mentioned uh, decolonizing international affairs and the UN. As an international relations major, I've certainly taken notice of the lack of diversity in our readings and our curriculums. Um, but other than this issue, what are some concrete next steps that I can offer to my university and to the United Nations um, for decolonizing curriculums and uh, systems and structures? Great, thank you. And one more. I'm going to go first row here. Yes, 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 yes. You. sorry. Question <laughs> and it is related to the decolonization process. I know that um, the UN was established to ensure peace and to make sure that states are able to interact with each other equitably and to some extent equally, I guess. Um, 
my main my question is this the first question is what is the UN doing to decolonize the institution itself because um, the time period to which it was created does like the functions of the UN when it was created and during our time right now are totally are, are completely different and then my second question is if UN members seek to decolonize the institution and the knowledge and functions of the institution. Why is it not represented where you guys are sitting? Okay, um, those are three questions that I think can challenge all of us, <laughs> including the panel. So uh, we'll uh, uh, we'll turn it over to, to, the, to this distinguished group. Uh, the first question on the, the education and, ac and access, education and access and then access for the voiceless um, to um, engagement at the UN. Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll say something about the second question, actually, uh, about um, decolonizing the UN and, and how we think about it. Um, it's, you're, you're, you're right that um, our IR theory tends to be very um, colorblind. It's like it's actually color deaf and colorblind and all, all of that, right? So, and last year, um, and, and political science in general is that way in my, my field. Um, and, and my chair last year asked us to kind of do an assessment of our syllabus. As a department, we did an assessment and, and looked at who are we assigning, what are they about, are we really covering um, you know, race, class, and gender issues in a way that's representative. And it was really illuminating to me, and I have done a lot of syllabus change last year, right? I highly recommend every department to kind of go through this kind of an ex ex exercise to self-reflect about what we are teaching. So I would, I would say that that is something that we should all be doing. Of course, there is academic freedom. Therefore, I will not say that people have to do it, but I highly recommend that people reflect on what they teach on that. So. Um, yeah, that's my two cents on. Great, thank you, uh, Savita. Thank you, and, and, and thank you for those really amazing questions. I did not actually think that decolonization would be such an important conversation happening in this room, uh, because it, it doesn't happen in the, in the UN that often. Um, and, and the questions are, are fabulous, so uh, good job there. Uh, and as uh, you know, my, my, pre my the, the previous speaker said that it's about um, how we're including gender racism in the syllabus, but it's also about what kind of voices are being included in the syllabus. And, and, and traditionally, IR, I mean, when I was studying, uh, and this was you know, many centuries ago, um, the entire syllabus was essentially white men, and most of the writing on international relations and uh, within political science, uh, starts at 1945. So if you're talking, if you're reading a book on Rwandan genocide, it will start that, oh, in 1945, uh, Rwanda became independent from these, these countries, or um, DRC you know, got independence from Belgium. Or, and it doesn't really sort of engage with the colonial history. Uh, and you know, with atrocity crimes and atrocity prevention, the kind of work that I do, past informs the present, and past in, and the present informs the future. But both past and present inform the future. So uh, these discussions are really important. And I you know, encourage people in, on the panel who are actually teaching and, and doing ac academic work to do that. And for my part, as an advocate and you know, somebody who works at an NGO, it's about you know, bringing and hiring people who are from um, you know different countries and 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 you know sponsoring their visas things like that I mean those things matter because you can say that oh we want to be very diverse but if you're not sponsoring visas then you're not diverse so those things matter those kinds of um, so I'll stop there thank you Daniel thank you um, I also want to um, first talk, briefly talk about decolonization then to Dara's question about um, access to higher education. Um, 
and I'm not talking about decolonizing our own syllabus, which is like, again, a very important work in the university when talking about the questions addressed to how the U we should think about decolonizing the UN, right? But that's an entire issue that is going to be discussed much more, international relations and the UN, which is about ideas and issues. It's about people and it's about power. It's about where do important ideas come from. It's the fact that the UN country teams only work on the global south, right? Uh, even though SDGs in, in theory are a global agenda, it has a very different impact on policy making in the global south where donors and the UN actually work with ministries versus in the global north where no policymaker in Congress, not no, but very few actually know about SDGs. They don't think about SDGs as guidelines for their own programming, right? So there are a lot of imbalances in um, our global system. Um, it is how ODA and, um, has impacts um, on certain things, and the UN is engaged in that, right? The UN as a solicitor of funds and how we can understand that. Racism. Um, last year was the first time that the UN um, um, had an, a report at the Secretariat about internal racism within the UN. Right? So the UN is slowly speaking about these issues which are part of decolonizing it. It's a question who represents the UN and we need more women of color and more people at higher um, jobs that, that some, um, that some and the secretary generals um, are political roles, right? There's, um, that the IOM gets certain um, roles, that the, um, um, for um, OCHA is always a Brit, right? um, that um, for peacekeeping is always a French. Like, like, like if we talk about decolonizing the UN, these are hard questions, but there are political ideas behind that. It's not just a technical um, like glitch, right? Um, but um, so these discussions are happening, and us as watchdogs, like again, us saying academia, um, that we are empowering global um, like alliances um, through ACUNS, um, that was mentioned, um, through other, the ISA, International Studies Association. Now we have a new... Um, um, a section on global IR, which was spearheaded by Professor um, Amitav Archaya at American University, a very advocate for understanding that international relations is not just a Western concept, but there are a lot of initial international ideas about that in, um, in Asia, in Africa, in the Middle East, and in other parts. Um, and very quickly on access to um, um, education that Darius was asking about. Um, one issue, of course, with the global agenda, right, um, and that comes from the MDGs, the predecessor framework, um, um, that we often focus on basic needs. So the focus of the framework more on lower education, meaning um, basic primary education, is much more stronger than, than in higher ed, like access to, because the idea is like at some point people, but, but I think so overall the, the UN system focuses more on access to primary, maybe secondary education, but tertiary education is like a luxury where often it out, falls out of this. And of course, to be the next leaders, right? To be to be part of the discussions at the global level, our social norms are constructed about experts who have graduate degrees, etc. Right? And whether it's right or wrong, we can we can question that. But I think um, that's one reason many many of us are engaged in academic networks to try to focus on capacity building and access, but also on 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 on, on, on creating more capacities around in, in, the, in the globe and learning from. Um, edu but again, having access to education in Rural like in Indonesia is something that's very hard to do for um, Columbia University, for example. But I think it's very important that we don't forget that all of these different areas of our development are so interlinked, and um, it's not just about creating the basic amenities, which are important for sure, but also creating the leaders that acknowledge the world over, that we pick those leaders to speak at events, as somebody has mentioned, right, and give the, the, give the spotlight to those who come from those areas and to learn from them. Great. Thank you, Daniel. And, and, uh, Peter and, and Courtney, you, you've each got an opportunity to respond to the questions or, or to r respond to any other comments or any thoughts you might have. Um, briefly, I mean, we could spend hours on this topic and it would be actually a fun conversation. Um, I think the, the issue about sort of decolonizing knowledge and in international affairs broadly, it is a heavy, heavy lift. And I think a lot of it, it has to do with I mean, you have to, to pursue this field well, you can't just be in political science. You have to know the other social scientific disciplines, you, anthropology, sociology, all these things can teach you a lot. Partially, it's about not just studying these phenomena as international political phenomena, but understand them also in the realm of sort of epistemology, po the power and politics of knowledge production. Because all of these things have an intellectual history. I'm sitting next to Savita. I'm always thinking about now uh, responsibility to protect and just war theory. When we talk about just war theory 
a lot of the textbooks start, well, in the Christian you know, 14th century, they banned crossbows. Well, really, that's, that's one story. But did you know there's a Confucian tradition of just war theory? There's a Baha'i tradition. There's a Hindu version, African tradition. So we all have to look at these different cultural traditions and look at what they're contributing to the larger story of international affairs. We can't just go by one textbook. That's the problem. Um, we have to come up with these new things that we have to contextualize. The other thing I want to say about all of this stuff is that decolonizing international affairs should not be some sort of utopian project. And something that I noticed in absolutely every single thing that my colleagues have all said, we all come back to the idea of practice. You need to find ways to make this concrete. Don't just fantasize, oh, we're going to change the world. And Yes, I hope you do that. But you got to find really concrete ways of doing it. Changing maybe the composition of the academy, that's a good place to start. Because we are involved in how we shape the ideas of the next generation, right? If everybody is taught, you know, the classic, uh, Savita and I remember this, but, you know, anarchy is everything in realist thought, right? Anarchy is what states make of it, is what Alexander Wendt said. Well, that was mind-blowing for people. Everything needs to be understood in these sort of social constructions. That's the first step, and then you can maybe change the world in that concrete way. Courtney? Analysts, um, I want to, uh, I'll take them in order, and I want to give just, a, at least for the first two, a concrete uh, opportunity or suggestion you can follow. So for access um, to and equity in education, I agree completely. Um, it's been mentioned before that I'm the treasurer for a group called the Academic Council on the United Nations System. Uh, we have an annual meeting. It was in Geneva last year. It'll be in um, Washington, D.C. this coming June. Um, the organization gave out 42 uh, awards to fund scholars from the Global South to attend, like $25,000 worth of awards for them to be there. So there are organizations out there that engage in fundraising specifically. Um, so I encourage you to be out there looking for it. If you're here at a UN event, ACUNS might be something that you'd be interested in, but there is some money out there. It's just a drop in the bucket, but there are things that people that of this audience should really take advantage of. In terms of um, diversifying our curriculum, um, Emma, um, like the others have said, uh, you, we went through a process of, of not only integrating existing courses, but also creating new courses um, over the last few years. And one of the resources we found a helpful is out of Georgetown University, and it's a long acronym. I apologize for that. It gives the UN a run for a mo its money, but it's called the University Leadership Council for Diversity, Inclusion, and in International Affairs Education. I always stop after ULC, um, but, um, but uh, they have um, a syllabus repository, and they also have like a... Um, I guess you'd call it a rubric for auditing your syllabi to help go through some of the process that colleagues have talked about. So that's a, a, a useful resource for you. Um, the one thing on, on decolonizing the UN that I'd like to highlight, and here I'm gonna be a, definitely a glass half, glass half empty person, and I apologize for that, is a lot of the attention on that will be focused on reforming the UN Security Council, mainly in terms of its membership. And I have to tell you, I'm not particularly optimistic on that being successful. I wrote an article on UN Security Council reform in 1997. I'm pretty sure I could take it out, change Coffee Club to Uniting for Consensus, and make a few other tweaks like that, and probably get it published again. I'm not going to do that, but I probably could. Because I, I think certain aspects of, of that are just stuck. Um, I don't care whether you're talking. I mean, in the time since, pen holders have become even more retrenched than they were uh, previously. So I'm not particularly optimistic about size and composition reform. I think where it's more interesting is to look at things like working methods. So I think even though, uh, and, and this is true on other UN bodies as well, I happen to study the Security Council more than some of the others. If you're looking for like charter amendment, concrete reform, that's slow. If you can push for changes in practice on um, un, you know, these kind of unwritten rules, I think that's where some of the exciting stuff can begin to happen. 
Great, thank you, Courtney. And, and, and I would agree with that last comment. I would agree with pretty much everything everybody said. <laughs> it was a really an amazing conversation. And great, thank you uh, for those questions as well. They were better than the questions I had to, to ask, and I think they spurred some really interesting thoughts um, and, uh, and have provoked some great conversation. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, Peter said we could have a, go on probably for hours on, on just those subjects, but uh, we have another panel. Um, and we're going to hear from students, from the young people that we've just spent a lot of time talking about, and we have to move on to that. So I would like everyone to give our panelists a big round of applause. <laughs> I, for one, certainly appreciate the honesty and directness and, and love one, I, you know, I hear that honest criticism about what we can do better and what we're working on. We're working in that direction at the United Nations. I, I, I can assure you within the, the staff and the secretariat and our agency's funds and programs, um, we're with you on driving that change and, and keep, keep your voices loud and, and strong and keep letting us know what we should be doing better. Very much appreciated. So right now we're gonna take a short five minute break so we can sort of get organized for the next panel. I, you know, or if people need to step out for a second, get some fresh air, but please be back in five minutes because we do wanna get this one started. So we have plenty of time to hear from our, our students next. Thank you. Um, if we should resume the session, please. Thank you very much once again. My words of appreciation to the first uh, panelist that uh, came uh, from the different universities. Um, and now it is my pleasure to uh, moderate the second panel of this event. And uh, in, in all frank and frankness, uh, I'm always a little bit biased towards students and also towards universities, because I was a, a university professor myself for 16 years. So it's funny how I am in the other side of the equation now working for the United Nations in relation to universities and the engagement of higher education. And I always say, and I want to stress this um, a lot, that when we speak about our engagement and collaboration arrangement with universities and colleges around the world, not only in the United States, when I say universities and colleges, when I say academia, I mean not only the instructors, the lecturers, scientists, professors, and of course, the university staff, but also the students at the undergraduate and graduate level, um, and even PhD candidates. I truly believe the students have a, are very inspiring and very inspired to act to mobilize people. They have created an innovative solutions. As the Undersecretary General was highlighting, our focus should be on the solutions because the challenges, we already know which challenges are those. We already know which are the global problems we have to face. Our focus should be what solutions can we get 
from the students, from academics, from scholars, from universities, and from different stakeholders the UN engages with. And for that, uh, we have a distinct uh, list of uh, students that are gathered here today, some of which are coming from uh, quite outside of the tri-state area. Uh, first, we are going to hear from uh, Ms. Sibyl Wang, student at New York University. Then we're going to hear from Lulu Okeke, student at Pace University. Then we have in Mariam Albacarti, student at the New York Medical College, which is also uh, the SDG hub for Goal 3, uh, Good Health and Well-Being. Uh, we also have Rolake Tomoya, student at Lehigh University. And finally, uh, Alisa Taylor, a student at Hood College from Maryland. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much indeed to all of you students here uh, to speak about your personal experience here and intakes about what do you think about the relationship of your different universities, colleges with the United Nations, but perhaps more particularly, what do you think about the student's role should be in terms of the global challenges that the world is facing, of course, but also the role that the United Nations have, and what, what, what should be the relevance that we have to give to the voices of students, and in that sense, your different personal experiences uh, in terms of internship projects, local projects related to either the UN goals and mandates, but also to the SDGs, of course. Um, so I will now first give the floor to uh, Ms. Sibyl Wan. You have the floor. This is working, right? Um, it is indeed an honor to be here at the United Nations, um, especially on UN Day, uh, to highlight the importance of the partnership between higher education and the UN in the address of global challenges. So me personally, for as long as I remember, I've cared about justice, or rather injustice in the world. I've always wanted to dedicate myself in peace building and promoting changes in the world. Um, so over a year ago, I moved to New York City, carrying two goals with me, to pursue my master's degree at New York University, as well as to work for the UN. Leaving everything behind, I haven't looked back since. I joined UNICEF in January this year, and from there I have had the privilege to see UNICEF and its partners providing support for those uh, in need on the ground at the wake of Russia's invasion. And now I am working with the UN Secretariat, where we work closely with the UN's Women, Peace, and Security Agenda by supporting national effort to increase the representation of women at all levels. It is really a powerful feeling to be able to wake up every day and go to work and to feel that what you do is something meaningful. And I am close enough to see the tangible result of what we do and for those of us who are close to those people and knowing their needs so well, we understand that we, we can't provide everything that's needed. It's really heartbreaking. So the question here is, what is the future holds for the UN and how can higher education better help the UN function? The UN faces the challenges of becoming rather irrelevant and no longer a beacon of global governance to address challenges. No offense here at all. Um, and that being said, renewing itself with new ideas and innovations with different sectors, partners, and stakeholders all together to address issues such as climate change, um, extreme poverty, and gender equality is very crucial. However, those innovations wouldn't have happened without the involvement of higher education, and especially women's engagement in higher education. I can say I am really lucky to have the opportunities to study abroad at one of the top institutions. However, there's tons of women out there who hunger for knowledge but don't have the access to it. Education is the key for a better future, not only for the UN, but also for all countries and societies. In the 19th century, when marriage was the only access for women to the society, um, Louisa May Alcott wrote in her novel, women, they have minds and they have souls as well as just heart, and they've got ambitions, they've got talent as well as just beauty. I'm so sick of people saying that Love is all a woman's fit for. And today, 200 years later, education has made women independent, and we are no longer dependent on men to lead our lives. Just like what Michelle Obama once said, when girls are educated, 
their country becomes better and more prosperous. And I'm gonna conclude with, there's still many causes worth fighting for, worth sacrificing for. So many histories yet to be made. Let us all hold on to that and continue to support each other on what we do and no matter what challenges we may face. And together, I'm sure a better future and a more prosperous one awaits. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sibyl, for not only highlighting uh, this relationship between higher education and, and the global challenges, but also the role of women and women students um, and how far we are from the ideal world where all women have equal access to, to higher education, education in general. Um, and I would like to give the floor to Ms. Lulu Okeke from Face University. Hello. Okay. Good day, everyone, and happy UN Day. My name is Lulu. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Good day, everyone, and happy UN Day. My name is Lulu Okeke, and I am a student of Pace University, and I'm a Millennium Fellow. Thank you to the UN Acad Academic impact for making the Millennium Fellowship possible. The Millennium Fellowship is a semester-long leadership program that happens on college campuses all over the world to foster the UN SDG goals. My fellowship project advances SDG 3 that aims to foster good health and well-being, as well as SDG 5 that aims to achieve gender equality and empower women all over the world. As we are aware, we are all in a pandemic, even though Max are not required, we're still in a pandemic. And mental health, at least from what I've heard and what I experienced myself, mental health was a big issue for most people, especially in the first year of COVID. We all had to stay at home. Some of us didn't even like the people we lived with, but we had to stay at home to ensure that everyone was safe. And since I have a passion for women and I was privileged privileged enough to apply for the Millennium Fellowship, I was able to use my love for women and women's um, empowerment to ensure that women grow and become better people through my project called The Letter Project. So I partner with an organization with the same name called The Letter Project, and I write handwritten notes, sorry, handwritten letters to women all over, na all over the nation. So women and Women and sometimes your loved ones write to the organizations. There's a portal you can write um, what your situation looks like. And so I go through the, the issues that the women and your loved ones talk about. And I choose the ones I want to write to. And this is a powerful, powerful move for me because I think it's so important to, because um, I consider myself privileged to some extent. And I do believe that it's important to know your privilege and to use it. For example, me being a college student in New York is a privilege. And the means I can use to help somebody, even if it's somebody who's 20 years older than me or 10 years younger than me, I want to be able to do that. So I write these letters handwritten by myself, and then I mail them to the individuals. And, and I write like 10 letters a week. So I try to ensure that I write as much letters as possible because I do feel like the more letters you write, the more people that you are able to impact. And I'm grateful for this opportunity because I do feel like sometimes as a college student, we feel like maybe all you have to do is just get a degree and get a good job. But knowing that the UN is an organization that wants to foster the growth of everyone in the world to make the world a better place, I do think it's an important decision to make as a college student to be part of that organization. So I'm grateful that the Millennium Fellowship has created an avenue for me to be able to foster my love for women and to be able to help women become better in their situations. Although me writing letters doesn't automatically change your situation, I do feel like just hearing from someone that you're loved and that you're not alone, even the United Nations SDG goals is a, is a power move because someone can just go on the website and realize that, wow, they actually care about me. Even though we're like almost 8 billion people in the world, just knowing that someone is kind enough to recognize your problem, that is powerful to me. And I do encourage students all over the world to do something that helps your neighbor. Your neighbor doesn't have to be someone 
in a different state or a different country. Your neighbor can be your friend. Your neighbor can be your mom, your sister, like people, your dad, your brother, people close to you that you can impact greatly in order to impact people um, outside of your state and outside of your country. And I'm also grateful for this opportunity to talk to you guys, and I'm happy that you guys are here and they were all just sharing a knowledge and a wisdom with each other. And I'm grateful for the privilege to further the UN goal three and five. And I do hope that students all over the world would um, partner with programs that are doing the same thing, whatever that looks like to them. And also I apply that students should apply for the Millennium Fellowship. The application is open for 2023. It's a beautiful program that enables you to foster the UN goals by doing something you love. I love like, writing letters, although like it's kind of outdated. But it's kind of nice to do that, knowing that it's not something a lot of people do. And people do tend to cherish letters, even though we don't really receive letters anymore. So I'm happy that I'm doing something that is not the norm per se, but also bringing value to their lives. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lulu, for those remarks and for highlighting the power of solidarity that I believe is, uh, is a value not only of the United Nations, but it's, uh, I want to believe is a value of mankind. Um, and uh, our appreciation to our friends from the Millennium Campus Network, the Millennium Fellowship for for their support and of course for advocating for the SDGs on campuses and it's great to see students taking action and, and fostering the goals. Um, I will now, now take the, give the floor to Ms. Mariam Albacarti from New York Medical College. Thank you. Hey, I'm Mariam Albacarti from Saudi Arabia. I came to the US three years ago to um, to pursue my master in public health. Um, I am a dental hygienist back in Saudi Arabia. And um, I, I was, I, um, sorry. Um, so um, my, my goal is to uh, bring awareness to my people uh, back home because we have like um, we we only seek health or healthcare just for treatment, but working as a dental hygienist, I felt like my um, my goal is to bring awareness to these people that preventive care is um, a better solution than treatment. And I thought like people won't seek healthcare; it's just a negligence. So when I came here, and I start. Um, my practicum at Feeding Rochester, uh, which is uh, we're uh, trying to uh, end uh, hunger and like uh, trying to um, uh, secu like uh, help people to um, give people to like uh, sorry I'm so nervous <laughs> so uh, so we had to ha to help people to have access to food resource. And um, I, lo I love that Feeding Worcester is collaborating with health, health centers and all the uh, neighborhoods, neighborhoods that don't have access for food. So uh, I saw that people just um, don't seek health care, not just because it's, um, uh, they, like, they don't care, but because sometimes they don't have the, um, the financial um, uh, the uh, financial ability or um, they don't have the time because they have uh, other um, responsibilities. So um, I'm, I'm still learning a lot. And going back home, I just want to um, work, work on, like, I mean, I just... Um, I, I uh, so like, like I'm still learning, and um, I just want to raise awareness. I know where is the issues, so uh, I can um, think of solutions. And I'm I'm trying to speak uh, louder so people can uh, hear the issues. And I'm here today because um, maybe. Um, 
people will hear me talking and like speaking out, they will recognize the issue and like we tr together trying to um, make solution. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed for having that uh, approach to preventive care, which I believe is missing in a number of different medical fields around the world, particularly in the developing uh, world. Uh, but also for highlighting the importance of studying abroad and how many international students actually want to take their knowledge and their acquire skills and go back to their countries and, and improve the situation back home. So thank you for that. Uh, and I will now give the floor to Mr. Rolake Tomoye from Lehigh University. Hello, okay, perfect. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to Jayashri, Robert, and Omar, and everyone else who played a hand in um, enabling this discussion to happen today. Um, I would like to start by saying I am African, I am Nigerian to be exact, and I come from a culture that loves storytelling. And oftentimes I find myself more drawn to a story than copious amounts of mundane lecturing. So I'm here today to tell a story. This story is about a squabble between two villages. These two villages came from worlds apart and didn't quite understand each other, but decided to host a party. Both villages cared deeply about the party and wanted it to come out as perfect as possible, but they kept on bumping heads. The cake should be chocolate, no vanilla. Only the finest china, no paper plates will do over small issues and over big issues alike. Eventually the party was held and neither village was quite satisfied. However, Temi and Akin from the neighboring villages hit it off like a house on fire. And John did relent that their village's composting system could be improved upon. There were little wins, little victories, little triumphs. Good afternoon, my name is Rala Ketomwe and I'm a final year student at Lehigh University. I'm studying computer science, economics, and global studies. I'm a youth representative for the Center for Women's Studies and Intervention at the United Nations. The CWSI is an NGO based in Abuja, Nigeria. The CWSI works on ensuring that women can live with freedom and dignity. The organization implements initiatives and programs challenging the existing systemic just injustices against women and girls in Nigeria. Growing up in Lagos, Nigeria, these are efforts that hit close to home, that are close to my heart. In my capacity as a youth representative for the CWSI, I visit the United Nations about once per month to attend briefings, conferences, and, and private meetings with UN officials on behalf of my NGO. My time as a youth representative at the UN has taught me that you work hard for the little victories. Working hard for the Commission on the Status of Women, CSW written statement and presentation, organizing UN-centric clubs and events, and holding little meetings on campus to win over warriors for your cause. And truly, no other experience has demonstrated this more than attending and presenting at the first international academic conference on the Sustainable Development Goals, Why It Matters, at Utah Valley University. Coming to Utah, I didn't expect to get culture shock, but there I was. <laughs> But there I was, confused as to what mutuals with a capital M was and why people were being so nice. And thus, it truly felt like two villages trying to come together. But what if we weren't disagreeing over issues as trivial as cake flavors and seating arrangements? What if we were dealing with issues pertaining to a woman's right over her own body? Someone being able to love freely and be freely loved in return people who simply want to live life as their most authentic selves. And what if, like in the story, we left with no consensus, some more vindicated in their causes than before? However, we were able to form invaluable relationships, 
Hassan and Henry started collaborating on increasing awareness of LGBTQ plus issues. And Michelle, who goes to school in London, by the way, Instagrammed me about a potential visit to my university. There were little wins, little victories, little triumphs. I believe that the voice of the youth should be controversial. Controversial in the sense that we should challenge conventional wisdom by introducing fresh thoughts and ideas. In my, cap in my capacity as a United Nations Youth Representative, my colleagues and I never shied away from asking the hard questions, and neither should all of the youth listening right now. Do not be afraid to respectfully and constructively, I must add, but do not be afraid to break the codes of civility and conformity. Ask uncomfortable questions, and then ask them again and again until your audience questions the foundation of their beliefs. Draw from your stories and lived experiences to change narratives and introduce new perspectives. Use the platforms you have to demand concise answers, to challenge that which you, de which you deem unjust, and to hold our leaders accountable. Remind them the reason that they chose a profession of service. Remind them that their efforts are only lost when they succumb to the vices of bureaucracy and unchecked profiteering. Remind them that all they do is for those affected by war, famine, poverty, or any rule of violence. So let us deepen our commitment and strengthen our efforts towards creating a just and equitable world before it is too late. Thank you. Thank you very much for reminding us about the importance of the little things. Uh, and actually, the SDGs are a perfect framework, although they are mostly for member states of the United Nations to design public policy. At the very end, we advance the goals with every little thing that happens, uh, and I'm grateful to hear those stories. And also for reminding us about the hard questions that indeed the youth needs to, to do to professors, uh, but also to all those of us who work in, in the United Nations and beyond. So thank you for that. Um, and last uh, but not least, we have with us Lisa Taylor from Hood College. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, it is my honor to speak before you guys today. I will begin my speech with this quote by Malcolm X. Education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. My name is Alyssa Taylor, and I'm in my final year of undergraduate studies in the major of global studies at Hood College in Frederick, Maryland. In January, I will enter a master's degree program in business administration at the same institution. The United Nations is defined as an international organization dedicated to peace and security in all matters. I believe the UN stands for more than this, though. The UN embodies global awareness and cooperation for all a voice for the minority, interconnectedness among not just countries, but people within these countries, and meaningful aid for anyone and everyone. This begins with education. I've participated in many organizations across my time as a student. I've been a part of Mono UN at Hook College for three years. In just a few days at a conference in Washington, DC, our college will be representing a war-torn but proud country with rich history, and civilization. This country is a rock. Serving as head delegate, Model UN offers more to college students than simply understanding the rules and procedures and writing position papers. Rather, Model UN offers an opportunity to understand others' countries' interests and the success and challenges of people across the world. When one has empathy for another, peace and security can be restored. After my MBA, I plan to go to law school and specialize in international law, specifically human rights and refugee law. Therefore, empathy is everything. And Model Yin has taught me that empathy and passion is needed to create binding international legal commitments that are more than just words on a piece of paper. The continuation of the UN goals that the Charter was founded upon in 1945 begins in our colleges and universities. As some days, these students in the audience 
will be serving as national government officials, international civil servants, educators, as well as leaders and staffs within non-governmental organizations. To incorporate students' voices, I suggest a common platform where we can share our opinions on topics and discussion at UN conferences. Social media is one platform. <laughs> However, the UN can use podcasts, YouTube videos, discussion boards, or other means to ensure our, posi our, our positions and beliefs are being seen and heard. Through United Nations academic impact, the, U the UN representatives can encourage, sponsor, and aid student projects as they relate to the UN Charter and the Sustainable Development Goals. Students should be invited regularly to conferences that the UN hosts, such as the World Health Summit, as students provide new perspectives on challenging subjects. We have fresh minds filled with understanding and dedication to the world, as well as considerable influence on social media. We are the future and our voices matter. The international community has worked together to overcome many obstacles. With the UN as an indis indispensable organization, we will continue to overcome these obstacles and look forward towards a brighter future with peace and security for all our world's inhabitants. And as I begin with a quote from Malcolm X, I choose to close my remarks with a quote by Nelson Mandela. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alisa, for those remarks and for highlighting the role of youth. And actually, uh, we believe that the new structure, the new office that was just uh, created through a GA resolution will help somehow to uh, have more students in the UN and the UN proceedings and, and when we are having these summits and other intergovernmental meetings. And I'm sure the UN and the international community will benefit quite a lot from, from voices of students like yourselves. Um, so I thank you for that. Uh, I would like now, before I, I have one question for to all of you, but before I do that, in the interest of time, I don't know if somebody from the audience would like to pose a question. Yes, please. My name is Fatia Fairuza. I come from Indonesia, and it's also such a privilege to be here. Thank you, everyone, for um, hosting the sessions. I personally relate a lot with the panelists today, especially because of me coming from a developing countries to study abroad here in New York with a lot of opportunities. Um, I am a founder of Shape Your Life Indonesia, where I mentor and give scholarships for rural air students to pursue higher education. And it's been going on for two years. So, however, coming from developing countries, I don't see a lot of opportunities to collaborate or even access to talk with the UN or access to talk and collaborate with other NGOs from the global north, for example. And how do you see those um, collaborations visible in the near future? How can we include more students or NGOs, civil society coming from uh, the developing countries in order to have a place together to work towards the same causes? So that is my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if, yes, please. Good afternoon, happy UN Day to everyone. Um, thank you so much um, to everyone and all the speakers for the opportunity. And my name is Valentin Kamal Rivera from Mexico. And I'm currently an international foreign affairs student at Lehman College. And my question to you, to the youth and the students as well, other than the institutional itself within the UN body and the UN charter to promote advocacy through the SDGs, how can you're able to help other youth in developing countries to promote advocacy, um, there's there's other institutional organs that can fulfill that promise to the promotion of the SDGs and the work that everyone is doing, and which is in very enriching dialogues. Thank you. Muchas gracias por la pregunta. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, with those questions, I would like now to turn on to our fellow students. Uh, whoever would like to answer, yes, please. 
Okay, I'm gonna answer the second question. So I do feel that his question was really important because as much as we're doing things to further the UN goals, we are, most of us are under organizations. So um, outside of organizations, I think it's important to use your voice. And thankfully, we're in the age of social media. So use your platforms, even if it's YouTube, TikTok, just something to bring awareness of something you're passionate about. Because, because of how diverse and wide social media is, like you can reach so many people. You can reach the little girl in a, a country that you've never even heard of. So I do feel like it's important to use your voice. You don't even have to, as much as organizations give you a foot, like a, a foot stone, footstep, a foot something to like further you, help you basically. But I do feel like it's important to recognize how you can help, how what you can do within your power, um, how your privileges have helped you. If you're a college student, use the resources your college has provided for you. If you're a high school student, use the resources your high school has provided for you. Because at the end of the day, we all have some form of privilege. So I think it's important to recognize what you can do within your privilege and make sure it's effective. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, please. Hello, I would um, also like to comment on the first question and the second question. I do believe they are somewhat linked. Um, I am also a student who has grown up in a developing country um, and I have seen firsthand the effects of our um, less than perfect educational systems. And this, this discussion that we're having actually makes me think about the discussion we had prior in terms of decolonizing our educational systems. And I do know there has been an emphasis in that discussion on decolonizing um, education within the West and how uh, universities here are taking steps to do that. But I also do think that same ideology has to be applied within developing countries as well. And within developing countries, I do think there has to be an even a step further of actually decolonizing the educational system as a whole, not only just the syllabus and what is being taught. Um, I can really only speak for Nigeria. We, till um, today, still follow very closely the British educational system. Um, a lot of times it was just directly imported without, um, perhaps more care could have been taken to, to fit specifically with cultural values, cultural norms, what would be the best for our countries. So. Um, so yeah, so through social media, through outreach, through community and grassroots building, there is a lot that can be done to send students to school. There is a lot that can be done to bridge the gaps that we, ha we have seen. But ultimately, those gaps, those solutions will only be a bandage in place over the true reform that's needed in order to ensure that all students from all backgrounds in these developing countries can have access to education, can have access to opportunities, um, the same way that those of us who uh, school in Western countries do. Um, so I'm not saying that we shouldn't make efforts. Everyone should still do what they can. I, I, I commend you on what you are doing, and I too have tried my best when I was home when I go home, but we do also have to understand that this is a structural and, and systematic issue that has to be changed at the government level in order to improve education from a crutch a level all the way to the past higher education, postgraduate post studies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I do have questions on my own, a couple of questions. So first, I would like to know, what do you know about the UN when you were, uh, what did you know about the UN when you were in high school, and how your experience at the, in, a, in a university or college changed either your knowledge or your attitudes towards uh, the UN? Uh, yes? Um, I didn't know anything about the UN when I was in high school. and. It's actually funny because I knew that I wanted to do something um, with languages and with cultures as a whole, like international cultures. I didn't know what that was going to be even in high school. 
as I, <laughs> um, like I'm in my last year of my undergraduate studies, and as um, I progress through my classes at Hood College, all of my classes are interlinked, and they flow back to the UN, and it's creation, it's charter, it's SDGs. It all flows back to the main like conversation that needs to happen among countries. Um, and I think that is important to educate. I'm a big pusher of education. I believe in not just education, but in quality education, as SDG number four is. Um, and once you educate someone on the UN or on anything, any topic, as a matter of fact, they can take that information and do what they will with it, but nine times out of 10, they're going to continue to further their education on that matter. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else would like to answer that question? Yes, please. Uh, I actually, I know like about the United Nations since I was in high school, and um, I always do, like if there is any donation or anything, like I always do, but I never thought like I would have this opportunity to be here or like maybe I've, I've never dreamed to be here or like anything related to the United Nations. So I've, I want to thank you all for giving me this opportunity. And that's all. Oh, we're glad you, you can be here with us. Uh, and actually to Alisa's point, uh, language and culture actually is one of my key inspirations to work here, and for many of us, uh, just on the floor where we work, people from probably more than 50 countries and many different languages you hear on a daily basis, that's for me, that's fantastic in itself, in addition to, of course, mandates of the organization and the values that we, we try to advocate for. Uh, my last question will be, uh, you talk about what you do as students, right? But how do you see engaging with your own institutions? I mean, I mean with your own universities, at the institutional level, what do you think students should do to do more with your professors, with the staff of the universities and colleges in which you, you are currently studying? I can speak for Pace University because that's my college. I do feel like Pace University should be more vocal about like UN related issues. For example, I'm just being completely honest, the Millennium Fellowship, my mom actually told me about it. Um, usually Pace University sends emails to parents about what's happening like with student, students, student updates. And she sent me an email about the Millennium Fellowship about a student that was talking about it. And I was like, wait, I've been here for like two years and I never heard about this. So I do feel like they should be more vocal and make it like a thing. like even if it's an organization, because I don't think there's a UN-related organization apart from Model UN. So I do feel like they should be more vocal and actually make it a real thing, because a lot of students just think the UN is, a, is an umbrella for a lot of things. But when they bring it closer to home, like for example, with my project is letter writing, even though it's still you know fostering the UN goals, things like that can make a student realize how they can be useful to the UN and how they can be an impact by just doing things that they love, because it's easier to do things that you love to help a goal than to do things that somebody else loves to help a goal. So I do feel like Pace University should be more vocal about it. Yeah, I, um, I think I total, totally agree with what Lulu said. Um, uh, I mean, spreading the words and awareness definitely is the key. And I think that's why we are all here, because we are trying to highlight education. Um, and also professors as educators, they are like the lead for students. Because when we're young, we have all those passion, but we don't know which road we're going to take to utilize all those stuffs. So we need to, um, for guidance for from professors and educators to guide us. Uh, if, this is your interest, and this is probably something you should pursue. And um, to follow up on your, um, you know, the question before this, I think that's why we are highlighting awareness um, here today. Because still, like in 21st century, m some of my friends who works in the corporate world, they still don't know what is the UN. And it's it's kind of crazy and it's sad, but um, I mean it, it is a real story. And she thought it's a it's a country. 
and she thought it's a cool name. I mean, the United Nations, <laughs> you know. But you know, it, it it does happen, and I'm I'm sure it's not only a single case. If I have this experience, so I I think the question to to leave everything in this room to walk away is that um, you know we we still have. A long way to go, but uh, with the plus of higher education and with all those, you know, fascinating um, educators who are, you know, dedicating their their whole lives in this field, um, I think, you know, um, there's there's um, so 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 much to be uh, achieved in the future. Thank you very much. Indeed, it was very enriching and inspired to hear voices of of young students like yourselves. Always a pleasure to hear from students uh, from the youth. Um, and unfortunately, we have to wrap up in, in the interest of time. So I will now give the floor to Jashri Wyatt, uh, the Chief of the Education Outreach Section in our division. Jashri. Well, thank you so much, um, Omar and Rob, for um, moderating both of the panels. And thank you so much to the scholars who were here. I know some of them had to leave to catch trains and to teach classes. And thank you very much indeed to the young people here who have presented and, and really to everyone who is in the room as well. Today is United Nations Day. And as our Under Secretary General said, it was created 77 years ago after massive shocks of World War II with really the aspiration of coming together to work together to deal with really serious problems that were happening at that time. 77 years later, we are still here. There are no lack of challenges to the global community. There are no lack of challenges to the institution itself. But as I think our USG said, imagine the world without the UN, which does have this extraordinary role of convening countries and people to address these very serious challenges. I think one of the words I heard the most today was really around decolonizing. And I think that is something that I hear so many of you working on. And I think the United Nations is really about being in service to humanity, to our fellow human beings. And I'm just really inspired by the conversation that took place today and to hear from all of you about the ways that you are working in your spheres of influence in your countries and particularly in your universities, in your place of higher education, because you are doing extraordinary work to promote these values and to make the world a better place. So please continue with the excellent work that you are doing. As one of our colleagues said, the Agenda 2030 is not going to end in 2030. We have, uh, we have a long road in front of us, but when this kind of amazing work and energy is being brought to the fore, it is very edifying because you feel like there are solutions and really action is the antidote to despair. So please go forward and happy UN Day. Thank you. Thank you.